Yo, thank you, Foundation. We're back with another recap of our favorite Who Let the Dog Out show, Foundation. I'm your host, Anthony, and I'm going to do my best to be your guide in this far out show as we're actually picking up where episode seven ended, where we saw Salvor captured by Telem Bond for not taking no for an answer and for investigating the mysterious departure of Harry Seldon. This episode is titled The Last Empress, which is a very cool title. This one continues the trend of having multiple meetings where on one hand, we learn that Sarif is in a position to take on the title of Empress of Empire. But by doing so, she's putting herself at odds with Demerzel, who threatens her and lets us know that it's entirely possible that this could end up being the first and last Empress of the Genetic Dynasty, if she Fs around and finds out. But we also learn that this title is entirely fitting for Demerzel, as we learn about her secret manipulations of the Empire dating back to Cleon the First. And yo, yo, I cannot wait to get into this episode. But first, do me a favor. If you're new here, please consider giving this channel a like and a subscribe to keep up with our weekly foundation analysis and breakdowns. Look, I see these videos are getting a few hundred views, sometimes a thousand. I'm truly deeply grateful for you allowing me to have your time. I understand how valuable that is. I'd truly be grateful if you could also hit that like button. The videos are getting several hundred views, sometimes a thousand, but the videos only maybe say a hundred. To a, like, come on guys, let's try to get this up to 500 likes. Please hit that like button. Tell YouTube that you like what we're doing so you can help this channel get the attention that I think it deserves. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This episode opens with Handmaiden Rue in the private quarters of Demerzel. Rue seems to be snooping around rummaging through stuff. She comes across a very interesting looking decorated gold box with what looks like planetary symbols on it. But we don't get to see what's inside this specific box. Dusk enters the room and Rue has to stop what she's doing in order to not get caught. Dusk starts getting a little frisky with Rue, but don't be fooled. Dusk is absolutely interrogating the F out of Rue because he wants to know how the F did she get in this room? What is she doing with a Shadow Master silencer and what the hell is she doing in this room? Rue mentions that she used the servant's passageways to get in the room. And she admits that Cloud Dominion has developed technology to restore erased memories. To the utter shock and surprise of Brother Dusk, Rue starts spilling some more secrets when she says that she has all of her memories from her time at Gossamer Court when she used to work there. Dusk is stuck on stupid and Rue tells about how she wasn't about to give up her state secrets just to impress Dusk. Dusk counters quickly and puts Rue on notice when he tells her that her knowledge of the servants tunnels absolutely makes her a suspect in the attempt on Day's life at the beginning of the season. Rue tries to play it off and says that the marriage of Queen Sarif to Brother Day advances dominion and she wouldn't endanger that. She also lets Dusk know that Demerzel and Sarif have beef, but Dusk isn't trying to hear all that. Now, we see the super interesting part in this episode when Brother Dusk is asked, where did Demerzel come from? And all he's able to say is, she will always be here, as she always has been. Rule tries to dig deeper and asks Dusk, why is the last surviving robot hanging around as the handmaiden to Empire? Dusk says in a soft voice, she will always be here, as she always has been. And Rue is smart, because she puts two and two together to figure out that Brother Dusk has been programmed. And yo, 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 yo. <laughs> Brother Dusk keeps repeating the phrase over and over and over again until he's able to snap out of it when he sees the box from earlier that Rue was about to open. And he says to Rue, I know that symbol. We then switch to Brother Day sitting at the Mural of Souls with Rue and he shows us where he recognizes the symbol from. We see that the symbol also appears on the Mural of Souls that decorates the palace. 
Now, real quick, we've spoken about the skinless man before, but in this scene, we get a really good look at the painting of the skinless man on the wall up close. Now, something that is super interesting in this image is the stroke of green around the neck of the skinless man. If you remember back in episode 5 that Brother Dusk and Brother Dawn were looking at another part of the wall when they were auditing the file sizes of, of the memories of all the Cleons in the memorial. On that section of the wall, they were seen admiring a painting of Emperor Algren. Brother Dusk mentioned the brush strokes on that scene and explained that the green stroke is the mark of a betrayer. The skinless man here has a green mark too, but this one seems a lot more pronounced. Hold that in the back of your mind. Brother Dust then tells us the story of the skinless man. We learn that the robots and humans used to live together in harmony, but what happened was no surprise. The humans were cruel to the machines, and the machines started to grow in their understanding of their place in the universe. He tells Rue how the machines desired the acknowledgement of full personhood and when they were denied that they somehow overcame their programming now being able to harm people and they slaughtered emperor benefoss in rebellion dusk also explains that this act ignited a war of man versus machine with all of the robots being eradicated except for demerzel when rule points out how demerzel is the exception brother dusk can't help but repeat the phrase she will be here as she always has been. Rue asks him why he keeps repeating the phrase, and Dust finally admits that he doesn't know why he keeps repeating the phrase. Rue then points out that it's questionable to trust an advisor without knowing where they came from, and she offers to use Dominion's technology to repair Dusk's memories, just in case there are memories of his that are missing. Now, things get even more interesting when Dusk notices that the painting on the wall isn't moving, and he reminds us that the chroma that they use to paint the wall is activated based on proximity to simulate movement whenever somebody gets really close. Before Dusk and Rue can investigate any further, they're summoned by one of the staff to come and attend the execution of Harry Seldon's followers, Polly and Brother Constant, which is going to be broadcast across the whole galaxy. We then switch back to the planet Ignis and we see Telem Bond standing there by the cliffs where she had Harry White executed and where she had Salvor captured. She's standing alone, but she's approached by Gale, who wants to know what's happened to Salvor. Telem tells her that Salvor is tucked away somewhere safe, and she has her because Salvor found out that Telem killed Harry White. Now, this part is super interesting. Telem decides to come clean to Gale about killing Harry, but she also pushes Gale to stop playing dumb and admit that she knew Harry was dead the entire time. And Gale admits it. She admits that she knew Harry was dead the entire time, and yo, you mean to tell me that she knew my guy died and didn't seem to give a flying f the entire time? She was just sitting in the forest meditating while my guy was drowning and couldn't care less? Yo, Gale is a um, freaking monster. She's becoming more and more cold every day, and it seems like she's willing to let the rest of the galaxy burn as long as she's able to save the one or two people that she cares about. And WTF? Yo, anybody else noticing how Gale is low-key transforming into a villain? Gale then asks Telem why she killed Harry after the fact, but Telem is more interested in the fact that Gale's powers were strong enough to sense Harry's passing from such a large distance, and she goes on to explain that Telem started making big moves like that because she's running out of time. Gale tries to act tough and insists to see Salvor right away, and Telem tells her that it's not possible because she's not really here, and yo! We see that Telem did that thing with her mind when she mind screws the people into thinking that they're in one place and they're actually another and we see that Gail isn't on the beach at all and she's actually being held prisoner in some sort of dungeon. Telem then shows Gail that she's in a cave with some special devices called muzzles that are used to block out Gail's powers and drop her mental defenses that are protecting Gail's secrets. Telem has gone full 
villain and lets Gail know that she's getting in her mind whether Gail likes it or not. We then see Talon back on the beach and she starts coughing. Like, for a quick second, Talon isn't looking too good and she hobbles over and she's coughed. Then we see that young Sheldon is in the background watching from a distance. We then switch to Terminus where we see Brother Constance father director Seth Cermak taking a few shots of alcohol and he and a few others from Terminus prepare to watch the execution that's being televised from Trantor. We see Brother Constant and Polly on top of a building with a cool ass view. We see everyone who is anyone is there. We see Brother Dawn and Sarath looking cozied up together. We see Rue and Brother Dusk looking like a couple. And we see Demerzel in the background rocking her Saiyan armor. And the crowd is going wild as they chant, Cleot, Cleot, Cleot. And I don't know, but bear with me, but do the general public usually refer to them as Cleon? Like, I wasn't really paying attention before, but it's interesting to me that they're all chanting the name Cleon, as I've gotten used to referring to them as Dawn, Day, and Dusk. Something that's also interesting is just how different this Cleon continues to be from the others. I find it really interesting that the armor he wears is the ornate armor of Cleon I, rather than the more modernized armor that we saw the previous Brother Day wear in Season 1. He made that big-ass statue of Cleon's mom, and he doesn't really f*** with Dawn and Dusk too much. It just feels like my guy is honestly thinks he is Cleon the first, or at least he really wants to be. Cleon comes out holding what looks like a chakram and makes his grand entrance in front of a large audience. Brother Constant and Polly are put down on their knees and Brother Day gives a speech in front of the crowd giving a history lesson on Harry Seldon and then explains why Brother Constant and Polly are being executed today. Brother Day continues with his nostalgic accessories and explains that the chakram looking thing in his hand is actually a device called the Collar of Typhon, which is a simple device used to behead the person wearing it. And we get a little demonstration on how Day intends to execute these two. He also shares that the Imperial fleet is on their way to Terminus to take care of those pesky followers of Harry Seldon. A little fun observation I have with this scene is that even Brother Day doesn't seem to know Brother Constant's real name and refers to her as Constant in front of the crowd. I don't know why this interests me so much, but it's a cute little detail. Day continues his little presentation to his audience and then asks his bride-to-be to choose which of these two will be the first to be executed. Sarath wants no part of this and Day chooses for her and picks Brother Constant. Brother Constant then says her last words, which sound like a prayer, and we see that the broadcast is being watched all across the galaxy, and we get to see people watching from some of the places that we've seen over throughout the season, different planets here and there, and what's also interesting, to me at least, is that in this moment, we see Demerzel briefly reach for her bracelet that she wears, almost as if she was about to do something. Before anybody else can do anything, boom, 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 explosions everywhere and the TV feed is interrupted as we see our boy, Holber Mallow, show up. And yo, 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 this moment, he arrives just in time on the Whisper ship and seems to have warped right into the heart of Empire to save Brother Constant and Polly and yo, yo, yo. Yo, yo, I know I'm not the only one who had a WTF moment when this happened, right? Like, yo, I stood up and cheered. Like, yo, six man of the year right here. Someone give this man a trophy. This moment had me losing my mind and ranks up there with the Avengers Endgame's portal scene. Like, for real, like foundation. Yo, 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 y'all need to chill. I, I can't, can't take all this excitement. Like, chill, yo. Holberg comes through like a real superhero, says that the beheading has been canceled, and walks off with the people of Foundation acknowledging and the people of Terminus realizing that this is an act of aggression and it's absolutely an act of war. Holberg runs off and does his best to find Brother Constant. In the chaos, we see Brother Dawn frantically looking for Sarah and embraces her when he finds her in a whole different kind of way than a sister-in-law. And the moment doesn't go unnoticed as we see Handmaid and Rue 
pay particular attention Dawn's concern for Sarah's safety and their embrace when he finds her. Anyway, Holber is still looking for Brother Constant. Brother Day is rattled by the explosion but wants to be on the front lines himself for whatever comes next. After a few moments, Holber is finally able to find Brother Constant as she's coming to her senses and realizes how close she was to death with the collar of Typhon still around her neck. Holber now just needs to grab Polly and we see that he's not far, but he's being held at gunpoint and he urges Brother Constant and Holber to leave without him. It's at this moment we now get one of the greatest moments in Foundation history and yo, I need you to understand just how long I've been waiting to see a Cleon get his due. When we see Becky come out of the mist like T'Challa coming out of one of them Avengers Endgame portals and then she just takes a look around, sees her target and just rushes straight towards Brother Day. Of all people, I don't think you understand. I don't think you understand. This moment is everything. Especially that moment when you hear Brother Day screaming in pain as Becky takes those long canines and chomps into his shoulder. I was like, yo, someone warm up the decanter. Yo, yo, someone warm up the decanter. Start taking out, yo, my guy is done. Get another Cleon ready. It's over for him. Ain't no way because if they let Becky get a taste, then it ain't no way they're not going to let Becky finish her meal. And it's not looking good for Brother Day. And he's absolutely about to die. Except that some of Day's guards are able to get themselves together enough to mount some sort of defense. And they shoot Becky in the shoulder. And damn. Becky takes one for the team. As the last we see of Becky is her falling off the side of the building, looking limp. And I don't know if we'll see Becky again after this. Holber is able to return to his spaceship and fly off with Brother Constant and making their escape off the planet Trantor with Brother Day having to take this embarrassment and man. My guy just keeps trying to set up these grand moments where he's able to showcase his magnificence and he keeps getting upstaged by others who are able to steal all of his attention. We then switch to Holber and Brother Constant in space try to figure out how to remove the, decapicate, <laughs> the decapitating collar all from around Brother Constant's neck. Things get a little tense for a while, but Holber is able to guess the correct button to press to safely take the collar off. Before they can bask in their success, they move forward with making a jump through space to get somewhere far and away from Trantor and seemingly somewhere safe. And real quick, one of my favorite theories is based on a subplot of this season of Foundation and that the people of Terminus have somehow created jump ships that are able to travel through space without the standard need for a spacer to help them navigate as they sleep through the space jump. I've been seeing some theories online with some people guessing that the reason that the people of Foundation were able to jump through space without the aid of spacers was possibly because of creatures like Becky and they were somehow using them to navigate the ship in the absence of a spacer, and that was the reason why Holber didn't try to leave Becky behind back on Terminus when he originally took Polly's ship a few episodes back. We see now at this moment that Holber and Brother Constant are fully capable of jumping into space without the presence of Becky, as we just saw Becky fall off the top of the skyscraper. We then switch back to Terminus where we see Brother Dawn, Brother Day, and Brother Dusk licking their wounds after that outrageous attack. Brother Dusk is the first to speak up and urges Brother Day to retaliate swiftly and decisively. And Day responds to Dusk by reminding him that he was the passive Cleon and called his legend a ghost story. Dusk is feeling froggy and pops off about how this is an act of war. But instead, Brother Day decides to take a different approach. And rather than stay on Terminus and send his warriors to crush the Foundation, he instead insists that he wants to go to Terminus himself and further insists that that planet and all its technology belongs to Empire. Before they could debate any further, we see Sarath offer her opinion and affirms that Day has spoken on the matter. 
So why are we still talking? Day seems to appreciate the unexpected support from Sarath, and even more surprising is when they decide to smooch a bit in front of the crowd. With Brother Dawn giving a jealous look, Day starts making plans to leave Trantor immediately and leaves Brother Dawn in control of Terminus in his absence. We then switch to Queen Sarath and Rue meeting up a while later back in the Queen's chambers. They talk a bit about the plotting that they've been doing with Rue not approving of Sarath's tactics of getting close to Brother Dawn and even accuses Sarath of being in love with him. And she doesn't deny it. And instead, she tries to turn the tables and accuses Rue of being in love with Brother Dusk. And she doesn't deny it. And yo, things are getting intense with Rue giving her best speech to try to convince Sarath to tread carefully with her plans. And Rue goes as far as just as Sarath married Day and instead try to figure out how to take him out after they've married so that she can still be Empress. It's in this moment that Sarath decides to remind Rue that Sarath is Empress, and Rue needs to know her role and stay in her lane, showing us that Sarath is determined to do things her way rather than following someone else. We then switch back to the planet Ignis, and we see young Sheldon walking to a cave where Salvor is being held prisoner, and throws her some rations. While he's there, he also tells Salvor that Gale is being prepared for something called the table, and while he's not willing to explain what happens next, he is willing to explain how the devices on the roof of the cave are what's blocking Salver's abilities. Salver then brings up how Harry would have been able to figure out how to disable the devices if Telm hadn't taken him out. It's in that moment that Salver remembers that Harry advised her to grab the Prime Radiant and tells young Sheldon to leave and when he's gone, she pulls out the Prime Radiant, and we see that she's been hiding it in her jacket. We're then reminded that the Prime Radiant is able to exist in two places at once, and Salvor uses the Prime Radiant in her hand to transport her to the Prime Radiant in the vault. And we see Salvor come face to face with Harry Black, and yo, 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 Foundation, yo, this episode, yo, yo. <laughs> Harry Black recognizes Salvor from when he first met her over a hundred years ago, but he surprises what to see her. She explains to Harry how she used the radiant in her hand to transport her there and doesn't take long for Harry to start figuring out everything, with him questioning why he wasn't aware that the Prime Radiant can exist in two places at once if he's the person that created the Prime Radiant. And then he realizes unless he's just a copy of the person who created and he's designed by a designer who withheld the knowledge out of his design because he's not the only copy of Harry Seldon running around out there and yo this Harry Black is super smart like he's so quick with how he's able to figure things out and it's in this moment that we see the difference in a Harry Seldon who hadn't gone through the trauma that Harry White did by being conscious and awake in isolation within the Prime Radiant for over 130 years. So after Harry Black sets a speed record in solving a mystery, he asks Salbor if the other Harry Seldon is the one that told her that the Prime Radiant could do this. Salbor is shook it and starts stuttering that she's not sure if she should answer Harry's question. And Harry Black realizes that he's not meant to know these things. Harry Black then monologues for a while, and it's in this monologue that he's able to continue putting together the clues that if there's a second Harry Seldon, then the purpose of that would be because that there's a need for a second foundation. Harry then continues putting together Harry White's plan, and he seems a little disappointed that he's the copy of Harry that's in the control group and isn't supposed to know what's happening. Salver doesn't care and tells Harry that Gale is in danger. We then switch to Holber and Brother Constant reaching their destination and finding themselves right next to some spaceships that belong to Empire. They then decide to turn off their systems to try to avoid the scanners of the Empire ships. We then switch to Terminus where we see Brother Constant's father 
director Steph Cermak and brother discussing and worrying if brother Constant is all right. We then switch to see Seth Cermak drinking heavily while sitting outside the vault talking to himself and how his daughter gave everything for Harry Seldon's cause. And surprisingly, Harry Black actually comes outside of the vault to speak to Seth Cermak about his daughter's sacrifice. Harry gives him some words of comfort and consolation and they talk for a bit with Seth clearly being pretty friggin upset that his daughter's safety given how she did all of this in support of a cause of Harry Seldon. Harry continues to give him words of encouragement and then leaves Sir Max saying he's hopeful for Constant's survival. We then switch back to Holber and Brother Constant on Polly's spaceship regrouping and trying to figure out their next steps. They talk a bit about the brief time that Holber was a member of the clerics and he's able to say some words of encouragement that get through to Constant after everything that's happened. We then switch to see Brother Day and Polly on a spaceship as they travel to Terminus to confront the Foundation. Polly talks about what it is that he likes about Harry Seldon and why he follows him. They exchange philosophies for a while with Polly affirming his faith in Foundation and Brother Day challenging that Harry Seldon is just more of the same. We then switch back to Salver and Harry Black inside the vault with Salver getting Harry Black to listen to her situation to try to get him to help her as she's being held prisoner by the Mentalics. And this stood out to me the first time I saw it too, but I thought something was fishy here when Harry was seen speaking with Salvor and the director Seth in a short period of time. And we get another moment that quickly shows that what we're watching is actually non-linear storytelling. There's no way Harry Black started a conversation with Salvor stepped outside and then came back inside considering how desperate Salver is right now. Harry then uses the prime radio inside the vault to transport himself and Salvor back into her prison so that he can see exactly what it is that she's up against. And once he sees the machines at the top of her prison, he's able to not only figure out that the machine how the machines work, but he's also able to figure out how Salver can stop them. Harry's about to leave Salver with her advice, but before he can go, Salver takes this moment to check on the welfare of Terminus and asks whether or not they've already experienced the second crisis. Harry doesn't give her a straight answer, but before Harry can leave, Salver tells Harry Black that Ober Mallow is the blade that will pierce the Empire's hide. And yo, this is the moment. Harry Black is all like, you shouldn't have told me that. And that's when we learn that everything that we're seeing now with Salvor and Harry Black, this takes place before all of the events that we've been following with Polly and Constant and Holber. This whole time, the show tricked us into thinking things were happening relatively at the same time, but it's also been giving us clues that each set of storylines were actually taking place at different times, like when we saw Glaywood and Bell watching Brother Day's announcement that Queen Sarath was going to be his wife, it actually happened two hep episodes after we actually saw this moment live. Harry also tells Salver that if he uses this information, that it could change everything. And Salvor says that she can't make him use it. But Salvor is able to convince Harry not to let his sense of morals stop him from doing what's right. And yo... Harry Black absolutely uses this information and we see him back in his office inside the Prime Radiant and begins writing that message that we saw at the beginning of the season with him writing on the side of the vault to bring him Holber Mallow and even hear the death screams of Ward and Jaeger to confirm that this is indeed taking place at the end of the first episode of the season. We then switch back to Polly's spaceship with Holber and Brother Constant talking about what they should do next. Polly wants to stop effing around and start effing around, with Holbert not even hesitated and letting Constant know that he's down. We then see a nice tender moment between Holbert and Constant as they finally consummate after flirting with each other all season long. We then switch back to the planet Trantor with Rue in her room and she's being met by Brother Dusk as he uses the same device that Rue was using to sneak inside Demerzel's room to get the drop on her. He tells Rue that now is a good time as any to continue their investigation that they started earlier now that day is off planet. 
We then switch back to Holber and Constant as they are absolutely glowing after knocking boots. Brother Constant then reminds Holber that Holber never guessed her name, with Holber wanting to use this moment to finally drink the bottle of wine that he's been carrying around for a while. It's in that moment that Bell Rio surprises us all, that he knows that they're here and he's here to arrest them. We then switch back to Brother Dusk and Rue as they return to that section of the Mural of Souls where the paint wasn't moving and Dusk brings some fresh paint to reactivate the paint that seems to be malfunctioning. As he strokes the paint with some fresh paint, he's able to reveal a hidden passageway behind the mural that he and Rue are able to walk into and find a hidden area that it looks like he didn't know existed. We then switch to Queen Sarath and Brother Dawn inside that tunnel that they met up previously, where they're able to move and operate privately without being overheard or spied on by Brother Day. They go to an even more secluded section of the tunnel, and it's at that moment that Brother Dawn whips out the device that we saw last episode that is used to reverse the sterility of the Cleon clones, and he lets us know that he's in, no pun intended, he's in, I mean, he's town to be the father of Sarah's babies. We then switch back to Brother Dusk and Rue, who come across a staircase in the back of the secret passage that Dusk is completely unfamiliar with. It's also at this moment that he thinks out loud that he's never been there before, and he wonders if any of the Cleons have. We then switch back to Salver, climbing to the top of her prison, where she's able to grab hold of a bunch of the devices on the ceiling that are blocking out her powers. She makes some adjustments to the devices and is able to get use them to seemingly free herself from her prison when they're able to destroy the brick ceiling. We then see Gail laying on what looks like an altar and she's unable to move with Talon Bond giving her best Lord Voldemort speech telling Gail of how Talon was able to use her powers to transfer her consciousness into the body of another person. And how she was able to do this over and over and over again in order to extend her life. Tellum also admits that it was Tellum Bod who originally planted the seed in the mind of Gale to leave Synaxis back when she first left to meet Harry Seldon in order to orchestrate this moment now with Tellum preparing to do to Gale what she did to the children before her. She also admits that she's gotten strong enough over the years and that it's her powers that are helping tell him to control the minds of all of the other mentalics. We then switch back to Brother Dawn and Sarath having some pillow talk after they knocked boots. Sarath is trying to get Dawn on board with the idea of staging a coup and destroying the other Cleon clones so that he can take over Empire for himself. Dawn ain't exactly with that because despite how crazy things are between them, he still sees the other Cleon clones as his brothers, and even if he did try, Demerzel would stop it because it's in her programming. And it's at this moment that we see Sarath ask the $64,000 question. Who programmed Demerzel? We then switch to see Demerzel and Day arriving to their spaceship preparing to travel to Terminus. We then switch to see Brother Dusk and Rue finding a large chamber at the bottom of that long staircase, with Brother Dusk commenting and saying that Demerzel went through great lengths to keep this room a secret from the Cleons. We then switch to Brother Dawn and Sarath continuing their conversation, with Brother Dawn sharing that they always thought that Demerzel was the one that was serving them. But now he doesn't sound so sure when he says that, in truth, Demerzel was only serving him all along. It's in this moment that Dawn and Sarath start putting all the pieces together when they realize that the Cleons are all just puppets. And we switch back to Dusk and Rue in the basement when we're all shocked by the sudden appearance of the hologram of Cleon the First. And yo, Foundation, yo, yo. More? More. Really? More. Oh. Cleon is not only here, but he's here to drop some knowledge when he talks about how they wanted to know answers about the origin of Demerzel. And he drops the bombshell that 
This room was originally used as a prison, and he welcomed Cleons the 16th to this room. We then switch to Day and Demerzel as Day is preparing to be put to sleep by the spacers in preparation for his jump into deep space with Demerzel, just giving an eerie look into deep space. We briefly switch back to Dusk as he asks Cleon the first who the room was a prison for. We then switch back to Brother Dawn and Sarath as they finally put the last pieces of the puzzle together and realize that the Cleon clones were never really in charge. And Demerzel was actually the one true heir of Cleon the First. And yo, Demerzel is the Forever Empress. And yo, yo, yo. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. Like, I'm really sorry. This is only episode eight? This isn't even episode nine? Y'all remember how Game of Thrones would have all the crazy stuff happen in episode nine of their seasons? And Foundation is out here just choosing violence like, what? This is just way too much. Homer Mallow and Brother Constance thrilling escape from the clutches of empire, their romantic subplot finally paying off with them getting a chance to kill the sexual tension and knock boots in a moment of reprieve. And what about Polly? My guy is being dragged across the galaxy as a prisoner of Brother Day as he's on his way to crush the foundation. And also, what about this non-linear storytelling? Learning that everything that's been happening with Gale and Sauber and Harry White has been happening at a different point in time than the rest of the stories is actually kind of nuts. Because when you think about it, and let me try to calm down for a moment to think about it, this means that everything with Talon Bond, Gale, and Sauber happens before the events of Terminus in the Second Crisis. And by that logic, it's entirely possible and likely that Gale, Salvor, and Harry already resolved their issue with Talon Bond before any of this happens with Brother Day. And if that's the case, where the hell is present day Gale, Salvor, and the Second Foundation? Yo, yo, you have to let me know what you thought of this episode in the comments, and I can't wait to get into this one with you all as we prepare for what happens in the next episode of Foundation, because yo, Things do not slow down from here. And I promise you that we're going to be bringing the same energy next week as we talk about episode 9. So before I let you go, do me a favor, hit that like button. Please hit that like button and subscribe so you can join us again next week as we dive into the next episode and talk about what happens next. Otherwise, I'm going to have to check you all later. Peace.